fully set forth herein. Continental's cancellation of Glendora's weekly series of public access programs from Channel 19 in Westchester on August 11, 1995, deprived Glendora of her right under Section 531E of the Cable Act to be free from cable operator editorial control. Regardless of whether the cancellation was under color or state, Glendora may bring an action against Cablevision under Title 47 of the United States Code 531E. Sixth claim for relief. Under the doctrine of pendant state jurisdiction and under common nucleus of operative facts, defendants inflicted severe emotional distress with no physical effect upon Glendora. Defendants inflicted upon Glendora severe emotional distress with no physical effect, damaging seriously her career, her ability to get business for Glendora TV ads, her ability to find sponsors for Glendora, a cheerful look at life, and to distribute the Glendora Happy Book. The, they also seriously damaged her personal life and her married life. Seventh claim for relief. Under the doctrine of pendant state jurisdiction and under a common nucleus of operative facts, defendants damaged Glendora's reputation and made her look bad in the eyes of viewers, the people she had dealt with in the courts, the county agencies, the people she has brought legal action against, and the judges in these courts, and statement of claims. Page 14. On July 28, 1994, Judge Donald N. Silverman, Supreme Court of the State of New York, Westchester County, in Glendora versus James Colfall, Cablevision Systems Corporation et al., that Glendora had a statutory right to have her program on TV, and it must be returned to TV, and it was. That statute is Article 28, the New York Executive Law, Section 829.3, no cable television company may prohibit or limit any program or class or type of program presented over a leased channel or any channel made available for public access. On July 19, 1995, Judge Charles L. Bryant, Jr., United States District Court, Southern District of New York, ruled that Cablevision Systems Corporation had violated Title 47 of the United States Code 531E, that Glendora did have a private right to enforce this law, denied Cablevision's motion to dismiss Glendora's complaint, denied Cablevision's motion to stay discovery, and awarded Glendora damages. Glendora brought these lawsuits against Cablevision and won them all. Public forum. It is a simple case that Congress mandated in the Cable TV Act of 1984 that cable operators provide pub public access, also educational government channels, and in their very words, the very words of Congress, these public access channels shall be electronic soapboxes. Now if that is not a public forum, what is? What is so difficult to comprehend here? Congress said these public access channels, since the broadcast TV channels fell down on the job, are to inform the public and stimulate public debate, debate, quote, unquote. You must give Congress a lot of credit for this, so Continental defendants of Bridge Glendora's free press by taking her off the public forum she was on. And to show you how irreversibly a public forum Channel 25 is, every Friday night from 10 to 10.30, Glendora's phone the number is on the screen throughout rings. One night she got 15 calls. That is the record. TCI Westchester runs a close second with eight calls. And little 5,000 subscriber Cross River, North and South Salem, Purdy's and Golden's Bridge, and also Pound Bridge is third with seven calls. A cable TV operator mandated by Congress and the state of New York to have public access cannot take a person's program off TV without violating that person's First Amendment rights. Liability. There is no question of liability. If Continental did not do it, then who did? There is nobody else to blame. There is nowhere else to put the blame. They are the ones who broke these laws. And the laws are quoted here again that you just heard twice already, both the state law and the federal law. break laws, you're going to be a defendant. The defendants have no defense and never will have the requirement of a disclaimer made by no other cable system that Glendora is on is also a violation of 531E and of 829.3. Plaintiff and the members of her class are threatened with immediate 
irreparable harm by defendants cancellation of her program on August the 11th, 1995. Punitive damages. Continental knew what they were doing, either intentionally or with reckless disregard. They knew what they were doing and they have to pay. They knew they were violating Glendora's rights and they went ahead and did it anyway. The wrong done Glendora was aggravated by circumstances of malice, fraud, wanton and wicked conduct on their part. Plaintiff must be, uh, must be solace for mental anguish, laceration of feelings, shame, degradation and other aggravations of the original wrong. Defendants must be punished for their evil behavior and that of their lawyers and be made an example of. Super is a public policy consideration publishing the defendants for their outrageous behavior and setting an example for similar wrongdoers. Plaintiff broke the federal law willfully and maliciously, arrogantly, obstreperously and defiantly and this characterizes every cable TV operator. A stop has to be put to it, and this is the court who should do the same. Hardship. The specious reason Cooper gives for taking Glendora's program off TV two weeks a month is to make room for new producers. Well, the law from both Congress and the New York legislature is, quote, first come, first serve. And Glendora is first come, first serve. Glendora does not believe Cooper's paragraph 4. Glendora has reason to believe there is at the present, at Austin, enough cable casting time for everybody. Cooper offers no substantiation that other programs were canceled. It is hardship on cable TV access producers to come to Austin twice a month instead of, instead of once a month. Other cable systems do not impose this hardship. Get a bigger closet. It is hardship on a public access producer to have only one program on tape. If a tape operator can't queue up the next program with a program left off before, then find one who can. How dumb can a person get? Again, the disclaimer is violation of free speech and is editorial control. Glendora does five half-hour programs a week for 11 different cable systems. She does not have time to fuss around with Continental's inordinate demands that no other cable system makes. Glendora never repeats a program, never has, and never will. She has given Continental an entirely new program every week. Glendora's contract with Continental is under the old rules, and Glendora is grandmothered. Plaintiff prays that. A, this complaint be treated as an affidavit in support of the motions contained herein. B, this complaint be treated as plaintiff's motion for a temporary restraining order and preliminary injunction. C, defendants be temporarily restrained and preliminarily enjoined during the pendency of this action from refusing to cable cast plaintiff's program a chat with Glendora in the form it was going before all these new rules were promulgated under which Glendora is grandmothered not to have to follow. D, defendants continue to cable cast her program at 3 p.m. every Saturday on Channel 19 South and North. As always, defendants be permanently enjoined from barring the cable casting of said show and said form and be enjoined from preventing the same of others in plaintiff's class and from barring the free reporting and debate of public issues. Defendants make good any program that they miss at 3 p.m. Saturday's Channel 19 by cable casting same Channel 19 either on a weekend afternoon or in prime time, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Plaintiff have and recover of defendants compensatory and punitive damages in the amount of $298 million. $298 million. Service upon the Boston defendants by certified mail return receipt requested be deemed good and sufficient service. The cost of this action be taxed against defendants. Plaintiff have such other further and different relief as the court may deem just and proper. Dated White Plains, New York, August the 21st, 1995. Yours in truth, Glendora, chat with Glendora, Box 416, White Plains, New York, 10602-914-949-9495. And is subscribed and sworn to before me this 21st day of August, 1995. Donald Davidson to all persons listed on page two. Here are the jurisdiction laws.
Nothing like having the law right in front of you. The money that these people make, it's just unbelievable that they do such dumb things. I also included here a demand for jury. Uh, this has all been received, as you can see, by the federal court. That's their stamp. The federal court needs new ink pads. I'm going to buy them a few ink pads. You can't read their stamps half the time. In fact, you can't even read the 1995 here. Plaintiff in the above entitled manner demands trial by jury of all issues so triable in the matter under the provisions of Rule 38B of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and respectfully request that this matter be placed on the jury docket with the understanding that a copy of this demand will be served on the defendants. Uh, case information statement addendum. This case should be classified as follows. Expedited, standard, complex. Unknown at this time, I say it should be expedited because this has all been adjudicated with Cablevision. This was all brought against Cablevision for doing the same dumb and arrogant thing and it was all ruled in Glendora's favor. So it should be expedited. These issues are resolved. Uh, this is what you call the civil cover sheet. Uh, basis of the jurisdiction. I put down diversity. Because I'm in New York, some of the defendants are in New York, but the others are in Boston, Massachusetts. That's diversity of citizenship. People belong in two different states. So that's it. It's civil rights. And it's also uh, breaking of a federal law and a state law. Now it says, do you claim this case is related to a civil, civil case now pending in the United States Southern District of New York, if so state? Well, I did. I claim that it is. Whether I'm right or not, I don't know, and they'll tell me. But I put down Judge Charles L. Bryant, docket number 93 Civ 8344. Cablevision defendants uh, violated the similar rights and statutes. So this was submitted on Monday, the 21st of August, 1995. I filed an inform a papyrus form. Uh, it couldn't be ruled on by Judge Bryant because he's out. And uh, so it was sent down to what they call part one, down to uh, Manhattan, Pearl Street, Foley Square, behind Foley Square. And uh, a part one judge received it. And a part one judge approved the inform a papyrus. And the part one judge uh, gave me a docket number which is in the other room. And so this will be served either today, Thursday, August 21st, 4th, or tomorrow, Friday, August 25th. And that's what happens when you break the law. Summons with complaint. There shall be a complaint, and there shall be an answer. Welcome to a chat with Glendora, and what happened on August the 17th, August the 24th. And this is the uh, Long Island edition of A Chat with Glendora, Nassau County and Suffolk County. There are three editions of A Chat with Glendora. Uh, one is Westchester County, Rockland County, and the, uh, another is Manhattan, and this third one, the Long Island edition. And so here are some jokes. One college has got so strict academically, folks, that it will not give an athlete his number unless they won't give an athlete his letter. Will not give an athlete his letter unless the athlete can tell you which letter it is. And did you hear about the football team that uh, declined their invitation to the Sugar Bowl because their quarterback had diabetes? And a football fan fell asleep in the middle of Monday night football fell asleep in his chair, and in the morning, his wife shrugged him on the shoulders, 
and says, wake up, it's 10 to 7. And the football fan said, who's favor? We are going to tell you about the law breaking of cable vision and it's very bad management. Charles Dolan, John Tata, William Quinn, Les Garten, Randolph, Osnara, et al. The names that you see on the screen. Uh, we will start our report with Cablevision with reading the legal papers. This legal paper was set out on Saturday, uh, which would be uh, August the 19th, United States District Court, Southern District of New York, Mondora Plaintiff versus Cablevision Systems Corporations, Dolan Bell, Lesgarten, Randolph, Tata, Kofal, Osnara, Quinn. Uh, Plaintiff Glendora's report within 10 days of what happened at the Rule 26F discovery meeting of August the 18th, it should be August the uh, 15th, 19. 95 Tuesday at 2.30 p.m. To the Honorable Charles L. Bryant, Rule 26F says to report to the judge within 10 days after the 26F uh, discovery meeting occurs. Glendora called the 26F meeting to be at her office August 15, 1995 Tuesday at 2.30 p.m. Callagy Strickland in their affidavit in opposition to sanctions and compel received by Glendora August 12, 1995 said they would not come to the 26F meeting that day but would telephone. In her reply affidavit August the 14th 1995 in opposition to their opposition to sanctions and compel Glendora wrote that by telephone quote unquote was not acceptable. Also on August 14th 1995 Glendora called Callagy. He answered the phone. Glendora said by telephone quote unquote is not acceptable that rule 26 F specifies a meeting that Glendora wanted the meeting in her office and that she was going to videotape it. Callagy refused to come to the meeting the morning of August the 15th 1995 left them a uh, message typed below on the telephone answering machines of the following defendants and all of the uh, that would be Dolan, Asnara, Garga, Quinn she also left the message on the telephone of Charles Forma, Esquire, and Mr. Astorita, Vice President of Security. She asked Mr. Astorita to give the message to Luscarton, Tata, Bell, and Kofal, who was moved to Virginia. James Kofal has moved to Virginia. A meeting of the parties is scheduled for today, Tuesday, August 15, 1995. This is the message. At 2.30 p.m. at Glendora's office to plan discovery pursuant to Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, Rule 26F, to discuss the nature and basis of their claims and defenses and the possibilities for a prompt settlement or resolution of the case to arrange for the disclosure required by uh, Subdivision A1 and to develop a proposed discovery plan. I suggest you attend. Your lawyer, Robert M. Callagy, is copying out. He is not attending, and he should. You have violated the discovery law six times. It is obvious you do not intend to obey the discovery law. Since you are not, then the thing to do is to move for summary judgment, stop wasting the court's time, get the $31 million. You are guilty as charged, and get the case over with. Take the Throg's Neck, 195 Hutchison River Parkway, north to the White Plains, Mamaroneck Avenue, west exit. Go two miles to Bryant Avenue, Rosedale Cleaners, and a golf station are on the corner. Left on Bryant, the second traffic light is Green Ridge, turn right. Go to 21 Green Ridge, number 2A. Park across the street. The telephone is 914-949-9495. The meeting will be audio taped and videotaped. At 2 p.m. on August 15, 1995, Franklin and Glendora are set up for the meeting. A, the laws are in front of us. B, what we wanted to accomplish. One, the nature and basis of claims. Two, the nature and basis of the defenses. Three, possibilities of a prompt settlement. Four, make the disclosures required by A1, Rule 26. Five, develop a discovery plan. Six, which disclosures, which disclosures. Seven, when each should be completed. Eight, and any changes. At 2.33 p.m. August 15, 1995, Allison Strickland telephoned from Manhattan. Glendora said, why aren't you here? Meaning where Glendora was in her office in White Plains. This conversation of August 15, 1995, 2.33 p.m. to 2.43 p.m. is on audio tape 726-1 at the top. Strickland tried to override the law just the way they try to override anything they do wrong. She insisted it could be done by telephone. Glendora was adamant. Rule 36 
uh, 26F says a meeting, and that is in person, not over the telephone. Glendora would not be deceived by cave in, nor cave in to their forcing her to do 26F by telephone. Glendora told Strickland that Glendora had told Callagy that yesterday, August the 14th, 1995. Strickland said, you talked to Mr. Callagy yesterday? Glendora said their communications were bad. They are in the same offices, but they didn't know what each other had done. Glendora suspects that Strickland did know about Glendora's call to Callagy. Glendora and Franklin also got the feeling that Strickland was being prompted by somebody in the background. Strickland does not have the authority to conduct a 26F meeting. Glendora told Strickland this was the 11th discovery defendants had defaulted on. The five demands due June the 30th, 1995, and the same five demands uh, due July 31st, 1995. Strickland said Glendora set the date without consulting them. Glendora says, so call up and change the date. Glendora pointed out that is not the issue. The issue is that you should be here now in person having the 26F meeting. Strickland said, I can understand your feelings about these things. Glendora is not sure what that means. Uh, Glendora just repeated that the issue is that they should be here in person now. Strickland's ploys were, why don't you want to go do it by phone? Uh, B, why not in the courthouse? C, why not in our office? Glendora said, no, 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 that they were not acting in good faith, that they hadn't done any discovery, that they were vacating, uh, that they were wasting the court's time, that the next thing was to move for summary judgment since the defendants are not going to do discovery, get the $31 million and be done with it. Franklin was a witness. Strickland and Glendora were on speaker phones. Glendora told Strickland she had better set up another date and soon, sometime this week, that it will be at Glendora's office, that it will be in person, not by telephone, that it will be audio taped and videotaped. Where were we? That was roadway with the wrong person. They wanted Ken Young in 1C. Okay, Glendora said that Callagly told her he would not be here today. So Glendora called the defendants and told them that Callagly would not come and told them about the meeting and that they had better come. Strickland at another point said, Look at the last paragraph of 26F. Clients can be represented by their attorneys. Uh, Glendora did not reply. Glendora knows everything the rule says, having read it eight times and outlined it in writing. Glendora stuck to her right here in person this afternoon at 2.30 p.m. videotaped. At one point, Strickland giggled the same way Callagy does. Glendora stopped the tape, rewound, and played the last 60 seconds for Strickland. Strickland says, oh, no, she taped it. After the playback, Strickland did not comment. She just said, hello? Glendora said we were beyond the hello stage. That is why over the telephone, nobody knows what is going on. You can't have these, this thing done over the telephone. They have to be here in person, eyeball to eyeball. When Glendora was trying uh, to interject common sense into the matter, Strickland, like a baby, kept saying, why? They talk so crooked, it's impossible to talk straight to them. That's roadway again. They think they can change everything around and do whatever they please. They fight about everything, their purpose being to delay, stall, lie, cover up, and collect fees, the antithesis of discovery. Just a second, I've lost my place. Page. Uh, August the 17th, 1995, Wednesday at 11 a.m., Glendora called Robert Callagy and told him there would be a Rule 26F discovery meeting on August the 19th, 1995, Friday at 2.30 p.m. at her office and that it would be, uh, that would be August the 18th, not 19th, and it would be videotaped. He said he would not come, that he was on trial. Glendora would like proof of that. Uh, Callagy said Glendora was not permitted to videotape. Glendora said that videotaping was all through the rules of 26 to 37. Glendora said she would call the defendants and tell them to come to the meeting. Callagy said, if you do, I'll move for sanctions and contempt of court. Callagy mentioned an affidavit they sent. Glendora and the court do not want affidavits. They want answers. Glendora said Callagy was just wasting the court's time and had no intention of doing discovery. Callagy said, if you have a beef with me, take it up with the court. And Glendora says, don't mention beef to me. I'm a vegetarian. Audio tape 726-2. Glendora did call the defendants and left the message on their telephone answering machines. Charles F. Dolan, Cole Fault, now in Virginia, Asnara, Gardner, Quinn, and Foreman. 
A young woman named Kim answered Astor Reader's number. He, Astor Reader, is the handsome vice president of security. And the woman who answered that phone uh, very carefully took the message about the Friday meeting and the names of those who do not have telephone answering machines, Bell, Randolph, Lusgarten, and Tata. Glendora called Callagy to tell him the above, but the switchboard said he was not in, that he had not turned on his telephone answering machine. She would not, the woman at the switchboard would not take uh, the message that Glendora had called the defendants and told them about the meeting Friday at 2.30 p.m. It is now 10.58 a.m. Glendora will wait to see what happens at 2.30 p.m. Friday, August the 18th, and report this. At 1.30 p.m., Glendora set up the video camera on a tripod and lined up the picture. She loaded the camera with a two-hour tape and checked the lighting. Nothing but daylight is required, no extra lights. It's a very good camera, in spite of having videotaped me all these years. The camera is very unobtrusive and is not distracting. At 2.20 p.m., Franklin showed up as a witness. He sat in lawyer defendant chair at the table. He made believe he was Caligli. Glendora asked him the questions. Uh, Glendora turned on the video camera. His answers were very good. His role playing was hilarious. At 2.30 p.m., nobody had arrived. There was no show of defendants nor lawyers. There was, in fact, discovery default number 14. Glendora found more discovery defaults in rereading the legal papers. We waited for them until 2.50 uh, p.m. Now this is the 14th time defendants' lawyers have defied the Judge Bryant order in the United States of America. They are in contempt of court, and Callagy is on his way to losing his admission to the bar of this court. Press went to Local Rule 4, page 4, 10th printing, June 1995. Glendora is setting up a third 26F discovery at her offices for August 22, 1995, Tuesday at 2.30 p.m. She will notify lawyers and defendants by mail and by 9x. Glendora will reformulate her interrogatories according to local rule and incorporate in it in 26A1. This was just another bad faith excuse, delay, escape, not to answer her first interrogatories. In mode, get ready, get set, go, is plaintiff for the motion for summary judgment Press them to Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, Rule 56, for $31 million and get it over with, since defendants will never do this discovery. Reveal the truth, and since defendants have no defense and never will have, dated White Plains, New York, August 19, 1995. Yours in truth, Glendora. And it was sent to that long list that we send these things to, 14 people. Now, enclosed in that, was uh, Glendora's notice of appeal of certain parts of Judge Bryan's decision, particularly the part where he didn't give me punitive damages, he gave me compensatory damages, and denying that public access is a public forum.
I don't think my conscience will let them go, and I don't think my God will let them go. So here's the second report. And it tells us that uh, I informed on August 21st, 1995, Monday, by telephone, all defendants through their female secretaries or answering machines of discovery meeting number three at 2.30 p.m. August 22nd, 1995, Tuesday, in Glendora's office. And all conversations are on audio tape 727-1. Glendora called Saturday and asked for Kalaji, and Strickland intruded. Glendora announced the meeting set for 2.30 p.m. August 22, 1995, Tuesday, at her office. Strickland constantly interrupted. She was nasty and petulant. Glendora repeated her announcement. Strickland said she would not come. Glendora informed Strickland that she had notified the defendant. Strickland said she would make a motion for contempt. That's two of them. Uh, every time Glendora started to say something, Strickland interrupted. Glendora said there was no point in, take, in talking to Strickland because Strickland would not listen. Glendora said, I'm leaving now. The recorder is on. Say what you want. Glendora's silence finally stopped Strickland's avalanche, and she hung up. The time was 10 a.m. Uh, this is on audio tape 727-1. Whenever anybody appears as required, Glendora and Franklin will be here, and the video camera will be set up to record. Glendora sets another 26th meeting, discovery meeting in her office at 2.30 p.m. August 29, 1995, Tuesday. At 2.20 p.m. August 22, 1995, nobody appeared. Glendora was ready. The camera was set up. The questions were written. This is default number 16 in discovery. So far, the defendant's lawyer have not revealed the truth. They are in contempt of court. Defendants cannot put in any defense of trial. Defendants have failed on A, interrogatory, B, documents, C, oral depositions, B, inspection, and E, admission. Local Rule 22, page 4 says all counsel must seriously discuss the possibility of settlement a reasonable time prior to trial. Callagy never has cable reached defendants and not done this. First went to local rule 3L. Plaintiff Glendora requests an informal conference with the court. Glendora will rewrite her interrogatories in compliance with the local rules, but this does not excuse defendants for their default in not answering the interrogatory served on them May 10, 1995. York, August 23rd, 1995, yours includes Glendora. You all persons on this list. Those are the defendants. For the week of August 14th, 1995, did get out. Uh, and this is why they've never asked for discovery on me. Uh, And I'll read you the stats. And I think the reason, well, how could they? You know, I tell them everything. It's an open book. They have nothing to hide and nothing to cover up. No, so really, there isn't any discovery to do. The cost in cable vision this week was $37.62. They took 12 hours and how many hours? 23. And They're law breaking, then they're cover up, then they're lying. This is this week's vlog. Started up. I think you can know everything that's happened on there. And this is funny. This page got out of left out of it. This page got left out. It got lost. You got misplaced. And that's on last week's vlog. So how do you fix that? Judge Bryant is in and out until after Labor Day. I talked to Tony Bravado and I asked her if she wanted to change all the current dates. And uh, I guess she was of the opinion, let them be. They'd get changed anyway when Judge Bryant came back. Or they would be, uh, everything would be looked at in August. Excuse me, in September. In August, he was away. When I went to uh, the United States District Court to file Southern District of New York, you people out there in, in, uh, in uh, 
in Nassau, Long Island, I believe, are in the Eastern District. Yes, you are. You're in the Eastern District. That's different from my district. And I believe your court is in Brooklyn, and that's ours is in uh, Manhattan. And then we have the branch here in White Plains. Thank heaven for that. Uh, but what I was going to tell you is that after I filed uh, everything, my informer papyrus, by the way, it was granted. Uh, we went through the whole courthouse. We went to Judge Bryan's courtroom in the second floor. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Red, thick carpet, wall to wall. All this expensive woodwork. And then we went to the third floor, but there's nothing on the third floor but the United States attorneys, and there's nothing to see just a little area in front of the elevator. Then we went to the fourth floor, and I think that is all magistrates. And uh, then we went to the uh, fifth floor, and that's bankruptcy. We looked in all the courtrooms. One courtroom has grape carpeting, another courtroom has green carpeting, another courtroom has royal blue carpeting. Another courtroom has purple carpeting. Uh, this is the building that cost $33 million, out of which I hope to get $33 million worth of justice. Uh, and then we went to the sixth floor, and that's Judge Parker and the new judge up from Foley Square, Judge Connolly, who took Judge Broderick's place. So we went through all six floors of the new courtroom. We always do that. Look at the judges. That's in addition to all the judges that I monitored in the state court. And only one judge was on the bench, I believe, and that was Judge Carey. And judge Carey's retired. At 70 years of age, he, he was the one who had the warmest trial. To bear in mind, <clears throat> as I've told you several times before, that a chat with Glendora is a public forum. Meaning, if you have something to say, you get in touch with me, okay? And we'll try to get it on TV for you. I'm a great believer in that. And I'm a great admirer of Congress for putting through this law that demanded uh, there be public access channels. Because broadcast TV, you never got the chance. Channel 2, 4, 7, 9, or 11, 5. You try to get anything on there. You spend the rest of your life doing it. But this is a public access, public forum channel. So anything you want to say, call me up and talk about it. And we'll get it in some kind of form that it can be announced. Well, I believe that that's everything that happened on a chat with Glendora from August the uh, 17th to August the 24th in the Long Island edition, Nassau County and Suffolk. And so that leaves us for jokes. And then we'll play some hymns, and then play you uh, whatever else is left on this tape. I neglected to inform you that also included with those uh, 26F meeting, discovery meetings, reports which Cablevision defendants and lawyers missed entirely and broke more laws. Uh, it included with those reports was a copy of the Alliance for Community Media and what their uh, interpretation and uh, their, uh, well, feelings were about the D-Day decision of the D.C. Circuit uh, versus the FCC about the uh, uh, censorship by cable operators of indecent programming. And uh, because this was as much as I disliked being associated with such things, uh, and, Gl and chat with Glendora will never be indecent. Uh, the, that case was called upon a lot during my litigation. Uh, my, my speech is protected by the Constitution of the United States, and indecent speech isn't. So, I included that along with a copy, make sure that everybody got a copy of my notice of appeal of four parts of Judge Bryan's decision. Uh, no punitive damages, uh, public access is not a public forum, 
uh, the costs and the state claims. But all the other things he ruled in my favor, and I really and I won the case. In fact, all of the Cablevision cases I have won. Good has won. You never really thought that would be so, would you? Now the fight is for discovery so as we can settle the matter of damages. Jokes. First joke is that a traveler went into a hotel and the clerk says, do you want a room with a tub or a shower? And the traveler says, what's the difference? And the clerk says, well, with a tub you get a chance to sit down. And you know those uh, signs that they have in hotels? They say, have you left anything? They should change those to, have you anything left? And Marilyn says that she and her boyfriend have a strange and wonderful relationship. She says, I'm wonderful and he's strange. This is a chat with Glendora, and this is a report on the terrible situation that we have in the state courts of not getting any justice and the lives that are ruined there daily. Uh, it's a report on lawbreakers to expose their lawbreaking. Uh, it's a report on standing up for your rights. People will take away your rights. They'll walk all over you any way they can out of their own selfishness and greed and avarice. And so, and it's also an encouragement to you uh, to, uh, to keep up the fight, keep your courage flaming. And uh, do what your conscience tells you to do. You have to live with your conscience. And now we will turn to some hymns, some beautiful hymns in praise of God. And these hymns are sung by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and are orchestrated by Eugene Ormandy, Philadelphia Orchestra, which is superlative. So keep your faith, 